As mentioned, my name is McKaylee Glennon, and I am the science director for the Adirondack Watershed Institute at Paul Smith College. Um, and I want to quickly acknowledge the other two icons here on the, on the title slide, um, because those are organizations that have also been largely involved in the research that I'll talk about. The top one is the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is where I spent the previous 15 years before coming to Paul Smith College. I was the science director for the WCS Adirondack program. And so the research you'll hear me talk about is all research that I started with WCS and just brought with me here to Paul Smith when I got here a little over a year and a half ago. Uh, and the other icon that you'll see there is the Shingle Shanty Preserve and Research Station, which is a research um, entity sort of extremely remotely located right in the smack middle of the Adirondack Park. It's about 15,000 acres in size, tough to get to, but uh, has some of the most spectacular wetland complexes. That is in fact where we are on the, on the title slide here, doing a bird transect in Shingle Shanty Brook. And my colleague, Steve Langdon, is another person with whom I've done much of this work. So those are the sort of three organizations that represent the research that you'll hear me talk about. The title of my talk is Birds and Bogs, Climate Change and Life at the Edge of the Boreal. And so I'm, I'm happy to share with you what we've been learning about boreal birds in the Adirondacks over the past decade or so. And I very much appreciate the support of Southern Adirondack Audubon and the Saratoga Public Library to, um, to help bring this work to you. I would much prefer to be there with all of you in person. It would have been a lot more fun. This is my um, second Zoom talk debut. I did this earlier today for a course at North Country Community College. Um, it would be a lot more fun to be in person, but I'm, I'm happy that you're still willing to be here and to, and to hear about it in this online format. So the birds that we've been focusing on um, and the habitats in which we've been studying them for a long time are what I refer to as boreal birds. And that has very much to do with the places that we find them in um, and their distributions. And so what that name refers to is the boreal biogeographic zone. And if you look at the graphic up in the upper left-hand corner of the slide there, the green is what we call the boreal zone. We are actually in the Adirondack Park just to the south of that zone. Um, everybody in New York State is technically in the temperate zone, but we sit on the edge of the boreal zone. And in fact, the Adirondack Park itself sits sort of on this uplifted chunk of the Canadian shield. And so we are very much at the sort of confluence of these two geographic regions. And what that means is that we have, um, when we look at our windows, primarily a northern hardwood forest type of a, of a habitat, at least here in the park where I am, um, but it's intermixed with some interesting and very, very northern flavored kind of habitats. Um, it, these, are, these are places that are adapted to being cold and wet, and they are maintained by very northern processes. And when you're in them, you sort of get the feeling like you've been uh, picked up and maybe plunked down many thousands of miles to the north of us. So if you plotted the distributions of each of the birds that I'll talk about, um, that are named across the bottom of the slide there, they too have geographic distributions that mimic that boreal zone. Um, they are widespread in the Canadian boreal and to the extent that they breed here where we are, it's, we're sort of right at the southern range extent. They are only in the Adirondack Park or maybe a little bit south of the park within the state of New York. So if you want to find boreal birds in New York State, you need to come to the Adirondacks to find them. The ones that have the labels above their photos there, the eight, palm warbler, Canada jay, Lincoln sparrow, boreal chickadee, olive-sided and yellow-bellied flycatcher, black-backed woodpecker, and rusty blackbird are the ones that you'll hear me speak about the most as a part of this talk. These are the species that we have focused primarily on as a part of this work. And the other five there are species that are also you know, within our focus range and, and species that we're looking for. And unfortunately, I just don't find them often enough to be able to, to say much about them. But I will mention that the three-toed woodpecker, the three budworm warblers, the Cape May, the Tennessee, and the bay-breasted um, are all also boreal species, as well as the spruce grouse. 
I don't use methods that are appropriate to detecting the spruce grouse, but it's another bird that would occur in these habitats. There is fortunately an entire uh, research program out of the DEC that's focused on spruce grouse. So we know a lot about that bird, but not from this particular project. The habitats that we have been working in, um, I again, collectively refer to them as boreal habitats. But if you spoke with somebody from the heritage program or from the nature conservancy or someone who's just more of a plant ecologist than I am, they would show you names like this and refer to these as places like Northern Appalachian, Acadian, Conifer, Hardwood, Acidic Swamp. I have a little bit of a hard time wrapping my, my head around all the various flavors of those habitats and I tend to, to think about them in a couple of broad categories. So those are Northern peatlands and these are sort of large, um, truly bog type of habitats. Sphagnum dominated, um, low nutrient, high acidity, types of environments um, in which we find lots of birds and lots and lots of insects, not a lot of other um, fauna, but, um, but birds are certainly very uh, high in abundance in these places. Northern swamp habitats are similarly sort of open with a little bit more of a, of a mix of forest and open habitats and a richer substrate. So some of our fen type vegetation might be in the Northern swamp category. And then boreal upland forest is a truly sort of forested system that tends to be on the edges and intermixed around these more open landscapes. And so that's the flavor of the habitats that we work in. And all of the sites where we've been studying these birds for a number of years are sort of a mix of all three of those different kinds of habitats. There are a number of different threats or challenges that, that face these habitats. And these are some of the examples of the things that, that I worry about when I think about boreal birds in, in this landscape. Um, residential development is something that I have spent a lot of my career looking at here in the Adirondacks. And, and by that, um, a very specific kind of residential development, not in town, but sort of rural sprawl or ex-urban development, the sort of kind of low density sprawling development outside of town tends to be on large lot sizes and tends to sort of fragment what is otherwise fairly intact types of habitats. It is not a huge problem for boreal birds, but it is, it does, you know, we do see development in, in proximity to some of the habitats that we've looked at. Similarly, logging is not a huge problem for these birds in the Adirondacks, although there is some logging that occurs on some of the sites that we've worked on and adjacent to some of the sites that we've worked on. Um, it is, however, a highly relevant threat in the Canadian boreal, uh, where we see, you know, large swaths of forests that are being converted to tar sands development um, and, and re resulting in, in fragmentation and, and loss of forest habitat in that region. But I think the most critical um, threat here in the Adirondacks is really climate change. And that, again, has to do with the fact that these are northern systems. They're adopted to northern kinds of processes. Um, they're meant to be cold, <laughs> and it is these sort of high latitude northern ecosystems that we see um, all around the globe as being most highly threatened by climate change. So the project dates back quite a while, actually. We, we started working with these birds back in 2004 or 5, and in 2007, we got a grant from New York State um, a, called the New York State Wildlife Grant which gave us the opportunity to do what we don't often actually get to do as scientists. And that was just to go out and get the baseline data. Um, we often have to have a, a fancy hypothesis or, or a specific set of research questions. And in this case, it was really a terrific opportunity to sort of go out and, and learn a little bit about these places that both the state and the conservancy and other groups had invested heavily in protecting um, and a lot of plant ecology type of work had been done in them, but less with respect to the faunal communities. And so we set out at that time for a three year project to document the status and distribution of this suite of birds. We use a really simple methodology. We have transect that we walk in each habitat. Um, we stop and do what's called a point count. So we just listen for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, I'm still take all my data on pieces of paper so I can go out and just bring my ears and a pen and a piece of paper and that's all I need and that's the kind of work I love to do. Um, so we 
record all those species that we see in here for that 10 minute period of time. And then we move along, along a transect and, and do five of those counts within each of our habitats. And that's called a, a point count. And so that initial project lasted until 2009. And since that time, now for about a decade, um, with varying support in different years from various pots of money, we have managed to, to keep this monitoring going today. <laughs> um, and so now we have a very, very long, um, large scale data set of the birds that occur in about 60 sites. You can see the red dots are all the places that we've been and that kind of corresponds to the distribution of boreal habitats in the Adirondacks. And again, there's, there's 60 or so that we've been in fairly consistently throughout the history of that time. So just a little bit of a snapshot of what we find as far as you know, which birds are the most prevalent. Um, this, these numbers you see here represent the amalgamated data from, from 10 years <laughs> of looking. And so this is kind of the pattern that I see year after year. The yellow-bellied flycatcher is really the, the top of these birds that I find most often in the habitats, um, followed by palm warbler and Lincoln sparrow. And then there's sort of a second tier with gray jay, now Canada jay, Blackback woodpecker, olive sided, and boreal chickadee. And rusty blackbird is really truly at the bottom level of, you know, finding enough of them that I can do anything from a mathematical standpoint to say something about them and how they're doing in this landscape. The others, as I mentioned, the three budworm warblers and the three toed woodpecker, you know, 10 years of, of looking for them, and we've got just a handful of occurrences of those species. So I can't tell you as much about them other than that. They do move through the Adirondacks, they do occur there. Um, they probably breed there in some instances, but I don't think they have as, as broad and consistent uh, of a breeding distribution as the ones in the top part of the graphic. And then just to mention that, you know, I, I have been really fortunate to have people that have worked on this project for years for me who have told me about all the birds that they see, <laughs> as well as the targets that we're looking for. And so some of the, the ones we find uh, very consistently are things like white-throated sparrow, common yellowthroat, Nashville warbler, hermit thrush, magnolia warbler, some of the birds that you can find you know, on nearly any forested transect in the Adirondacks. So after we had about a five year data set, we set out to try to look into how the birds were doing and whether we could understand some of the underlying drivers of what we were finding with respect to the trends. And so I'll talk first about these, these three sort of concepts that we wanted to investigate as a part of understanding the status and the trends of, of boreal birds in the Adirondacks. Um, the first one is metapopulation dynamics, and that's just a fancy word for the idea that these birds inhabit distinct patches of habitat on the Adirondack landscape. Most of our landscape is tempered forest and the boreal within it is kind of patchy. So any critter that lives in a, in a distinct patchy habitat like that has a possibility of exhibiting this kind of a population structure. And you may have heard of something like island biogeography whereby the idea is just that larger patches of habitat are gonna be better. They're more likely to be occupied. And even better than that are large patches of habitat that are connected to other habitats. This is something we learn about in biology, but here was an opportunity to look for it actually on the ground in our landscape. And so we did that. We wanted to understand whether our birds followed those metapopulation dynamics because we can take some lessons from that um, as far as how, thinking about how to conserve them in our landscape. Second was climate change. We know that this is potentially a very important threat for these birds. Five years is not a terrific span of time to ask questions about climate change. And so what we did initially was to use some kind of proxies for climate change with latitude and elevation. And we just asked the question, are they moving either upward in latitude or upward in elevation over the period of time that we've looked at them? Those are patterns, again, that are documented around the globe where we see these high latitude ecosystems sort of shifting northward or shifting up in elevation. And we wanted to see if that was happening here. And then last, human footprint, again, drawing upon my own work and work of, of many scientists all around the planet, you know, does the pattern of housing and development and roads and anthropogenic sort of features on the landscape influence how these birds use habitats? And so we measured these basic parameters at each of our study sites. How big are they? How connected are they? What latitude and elevation are they at? and how much of that sort of human infrastructure is present 
And we looked at that in the context of what their population trends were telling us. So before I get into those particular questions, I'll just show you what the trends are because unfortunately this has kind of become the overarching story of this research. And this is, this is the full 10 year period of time that you're looking at here. But when I look at the period between 2007 and 2016, that decadal picture, you notice right away that with the exception of palm warbler, which is expanding and doing well, um, everybody else, Canada J is, is sort of steady, but everybody else has a downward pointing trajectory. Some of these are declining trends that we were already aware of. We know that Rusty Blackbird, for example, has been declining in North America for many years. Um, there was evidence of olive-sided flycatcher declining as well in some places, and we know a little bit about the potential causes of those declines. I'm troubled by them here. I'm also troubled by the declining trends that I see, especially for the species like blackback woodpecker and boreal chickadee, because those are resident birds. So whatever is happening and causing them to decline, we can't blame it on anything that's occurring in the wintering grounds. We can't blame it on habitat fragmentation in the tropics. It's happening to them here because this is the only place that they are year round. And so that's sort of become kind of overshadowed <laughs> some, of the, some of the interesting questions that we were asking is, boy, this is really a, a sad picture. Um, and I'm gonna put another graphic on top of this just in case there's anybody listening today who's mathematically or statistically inclined who's suspicious of those um, really curvilinear uh, kinds of curves that, that you know is you might question whether real populations actually behave that way. It has to do with the way that these models are parameterized. What you're doing is calculating the vital rates and then from that you're projecting where the population is going. In reality they do bump up and down each year. The errors associated with any of these graphics are much, much higher. So I tend to not, not use these numbers and I wouldn't put a lot of stock in the individual numbers for any of these species from year to year, but I would put a lot of stock in the trends. And so if you look at the red lines on top of those yearly estimates of occupancy, again, you see the same pattern. For Palm, it's going up. For Canada J, it's a pretty flat line. And for everyone else, it's a downward pointing line. And if you apply your sort of high school mathematics and figure out where that line's gonna cross the x-axis, you can start to see that for some of these species, if that trend continues, you know, it's, it's not so far down the road that it might be pretty difficult to find some of these species in the Adirondacks. So with respect to those questions that we looked at um, and the specific hypotheses that we tested, we did in fact find that persistence um, was higher in the, in the larger, more connected wetlands. We found that the bigger wetlands, bigger spaces had more birds in them and were more likely to remain occupied. And even better, the ones that were more connected. So we just confirmed that they do exhibit that metapopulation structure in this landscape. We found um, a very consistent signal across all the species that um, human footprint does influence them, despite the fact that I don't think of these habitats as being particularly close to a lot of development. It's close enough that it influences their likelihood of, of occupying and remaining in, in any of these wetlands. The ones that were farther away from human infrastructure were more likely to have these birds in them and for the birds to remain in those places long term. With respect to climate change, again, we asked the question about latitude and elevation, which are kind of proxies. And what we found was a little bit of a mixed signal. We saw some species that seemed to be moving up over time, um, either in latitude and elevation, but not universally and not across all of the species. And so we sort of said, well, that's a bit of a mixed signal. And what that tells us is that we need to sort of maybe look more closely at this climate change signal, especially now at this point where we have a 10 plus year um, picture and we can start to really, you can start to actually think about climate change when you get into a decadal period of time. And so what I'll focus on now is sort of the second phase of this research, the more recent research where we have specifically looked at climate change and looked specifically at temperature and precipitation as drivers on influencing the trends of these birds. And we've also tried to take all of the information from this research and, and kind of put it together and identify whether there are places that we would consider to be refugia that might be 
high quality habitats that are maintaining their boreal birds that we wanna make sure that we protect over time. So to look at climate, we have to get information from some sort of source about patterns in temperature and precipitation. The Adirondacks, like many places that are remote and that are mountainous, um, unfortunately, we suffer from a lack of, of weather stations here in the Adirondacks. Um, I, in an ideal world, I would have a data logger in every single one of these study sites. We don't have that. Um, we have to rely on, on data that we can get from other places. And that often means some kind of a modeled climate product. So we got data from what's called the PRISM project or the PRISM group in Oregon State. And, and what this type of a project does is to take all of the data that are available from the weather stations we do have and combine it with information on slope and elevation and what we know about climate to sort of model how that would look spatially across the landscape. And that's really the only way that I can have a sense of what truly was happening with pre precipitation and temperature in all of our locations for a decade. So we extracted data on uh, temperature and precipitation, both for the breeding season and the wintering season. We looked at the averages, but we also looked at the variability and the extremes. And that's sort of an open question in the climate literature. You see papers that investigate all three of those because we don't really know. It depends on what taxa you're looking at, whether it's the, the craziness of the weather, whether it's the extreme events or whether it's just the average conditions that are most important. So we investigated all three of them and I'll just state right now that for us, what we found was that the average conditions over time really were the most important in explaining the patterns we saw in the bird communities. So this graphic is an extremely simplified version of many, many, many models. <laughs> and if you really wanna dig into everything that we looked at, you can grab the paper that we, we wrote in the fall. But um, this is my best attempt to try to capture a bunch of information in, in one relatively simple way, just to, to illustrate for you what we found. And that was that precipitation, both in the summer and in the winter, had a generally negative influence on these birds. So sites that were on average wetter, either in the breeding season or in the winter, were less likely to be occupied and to remain occupied by boreal birds. That was a stronger signal during the winter time than it was during the breeding season. Temperature, on the other hand, um, was more important during the breeding season, which is not so surprising given that all of the birds are here in the summer and only a handful of them are here in the winter time. But it was a primarily positive influence. So sites that were warmer on average during both the breeding and the non-breeding seasons we're more likely to be uh, places where we would find these birds and places where these birds would persist over time. So the next thing that we tried to do um, was to sort of look beyond just the species that we had been tracking for so many years to think more in terms of the broader bird community in these habitats and think about what its future might be. Again, we've got data for lots of species because I have terrific birders that have told me about lots of birds in these habitats. We know, unfortunately, that some of our boiled birds might be on their way out. So can we think about what the future bird community might look like in these places? Can we identify where that change is happening more quickly or less quickly? And can we think about where we might be able to slow down that change or where it is happening slowly and we wanna make sure that we can, we can protect those places? So what we did in this instance was to take the data for a bunch of other species, we have found um, 70 plus percent of all the birds that are known to breed in New York State at one time or another we have documented in our boreal wetlands. So we know these are really super important places for birds. Um, some of them, we have enough data that we can actually count, you know, they're there often enough that we, that we could actually count, calculate a trend for them. So we had about 60, we had 57 species that we could run a trend for and look at in the same way that we had looked at the trends for our boreal birds. And so we did that and we asked questions of, you know, who's increasing, who's decreasing, and can we see any patterns among different guilds or functional groups of birds that would help us understand the characteristics of species that are persisting in these places, increasing in these places, or decreasing in these places. And then we took the same question and kind of flipped it and asked it from the perspective of the sites themselves. 
can we identify places where the process of loss or gain of species is occurring more rapidly or less rapidly? And in particular, can we find the places that the loss of the boreal birds is happening most slowly and identify the characteristics of those sites that might be our most important sites? So among those 57 that we tested, the majority of them were doing fine. The majority of them didn't have a trend that indicated any strong pattern up or down, which is great news. But there were 16 that had um, a population parameter that suggested that they were declining. Half of those I already told you about. Six of them are boreal species that we had previously identified to definitely be exhibiting a pattern of decline. There are a couple of other species that have a similarly northern distribution, which maybe should have been on our, our official target list for this project from the start that also were exhibiting decline. For example, Canada warbler. Um, others in that vein are things like pine siskin, magnolia warbler. They have maybe not quite as northern of a distribution, but, but pretty northern. And they too were showing patterns of decline. So of the 16 we saw declining, straight up half of them were those northern types of species. The other ones, the other eight, were kind of a mix of different types of birds, um, including some, and this was troubling to me, that I would consider to be pretty common birds, um, like red-winged blackbird, grackles, song sparrows, for example. When we looked at that from a guild standpoint, again, the most prevalent pattern, unfortunately, was boreal birds are the ones you're losing. The very ones you've been looking at in these habitats are the ones that are leaving these habitats most, most rapidly. But we did see a little bit of declining occupancy among some other groups, including some forest interior birds, not in forest generalists. Forest generalists were doing great, but some of the forest interior species that need really remote types of you know, habitats that's not fragmented. Um, some scrubland and shrub nesting species. Again, that is a kind of an unnatural habitat in the Adirondacks and one that is um, you know, meant to be ephemeral. We don't have a lot of natural shrubland kind of habitat in the Adirondacks, so it's not overly surprising to me. But, um, and then again, some decline in a few other groups, including some blackbirds, and some flight. So the last thing again that we wanted to do with this analysis was to ask the question of change not from the standpoint of individual species but from the sites themselves and to try to determine if we could identify characteristics of sites that were holding on to that northern bird community flavor that we were interested in. And we had a few different thoughts or hypotheses of what could be driving um, some of those patterns. One being competition. We know, for example, that sites that are in closer proximity to, to anthropogenic sort of influence on the landscape are likely to have more human adapted types of species that might be important competitors for some of our birds. For example, if you're a gray jay, maybe a blue jay or a bunch of blue jays that come in because they're adapted to hu human habitation nearby, might be a, a source of competition. Similarly, a boreal chickadee, you know, in the face of, of many, many black cap chickadees or a rusty blackbird with lots and lots of red winged blackbirds. So one thought was whether or not some of the more generalist competitors um, were changing things in some of these habitats. Similarly, we could be potentially seeing competition from southern species coming in. And I don't mean um, pelicans and flamingos <laughs> in the context of southern species. What I mean is just species whose geographic center of their distribution is, is somewhere to the south of the Adirondack Park, whereas the boreal birds that we're focused on are very much centered to the north of the park. So species that we have lots more of sort of throughout the eastern part of the country that over time are becoming more prevalent in these habitats. A secondary thought we had was, was whether or not the, the structure of the habitat was mediating the change. So we looked again at the, at the various types of habitats in, in each of our, our study sites and looked at how that related to rates of change in birds. And then last, we looked at the notion of climate stability. There's some suggestion from past research that in, in areas of, um, in times of past climate change, places that have been refugia have been places where the climate has remained more stable um, than other places, more like sort of long-term averages. And so we looked at that as well. And what we found was, I don't seem to be able to advance my slide. What we found was that the sites that had the highest persistence of boreal bird species were sites that did have 
fewer of those generalist competitors or potential generalist competitors and fewer of the sort of more Southern species moving into those sites. They were sites where winter precipitation was sort of most like the winter that we have always known. Um, I didn't see any signal with respect to temperature or with respect to precipitation during the breeding season, but winter was important and specifically the places that had a long-term winter pattern that was sort of less crazy, more like traditional winter, um, were the places that had, had highest persistence of broiled birds. And last, and this was the strongest signal, was the sites that were dominated by this northern peatland type. These were the large open bogs. Those were the sites that seemed to be holding on to that northern bird community, more so than sites that were more dominated by some of the other habitat types. So what does a perfect site look like for these birds? This site is not perfect. It has a railroad grade going through it and it probably altered the hydrology quite a bit. It's got you know lots and lots of people, walking dogs, and it's got a lot of snowmobiles in the wintertime, but it's a perfect picture. And so I stole it from my friend, Brendan. Um, and it is a site that I think encompasses many of the characteristics that we have found to be highly favorable for these birds. This is Bloomingdale Bog um, outside of Saranac Lake. And it is, for example, a site that has abundant areas of that open peatland habitat type with sort of smaller pockets of the other flavors mixed in there. It is large, it is connected. There's lots of other royal habitat nearby. Within the geography of the Adirondacks, it's at high latitude and low elevation. Um, it has generally, maybe not this site as much as others, but it has low human footprint, not a lot of development, um, and therefore probably fewer of those potential competitors in the form of sort of more common human adapted species that might come into a site like this. It's a site that has a stable winter precipitation where most of our precipitation comes in the form of snow, where we have less of the sort of crazy freezing and thawing cycles that we've seen more recently. So the winter again, looks more like what we think of as traditional winter. And on average, it's a site that is warm and dry. And that's the point that I wanna, wanna finish on and talk about for a little while because it seems somewhat counterintuitive, at least to me, to find that warmer conditions and drier conditions we found to be associated with high persistence of these species. Because if that's the case, if warmer is fine and drier is fine, then why are we worried about climate change? <laughs> why are we worried about it getting warmer um, if that is the case? And so I think that I have a few thoughts on, on, on the patterns that we found. Um, one is that, oops, one is that these birds um, are not moose. These are tiny birds that are, you know, they weigh a couple of quarters maybe. Um, they aren't going to be subject to the sort of thermal regulatory demands of something like a large mammal who, you know, a moose can definitely overheat under certain high temperature conditions and needs to seek refuge in places like lakes and wetlands and who also suffer from, you know, all kinds of problems associated with ticks who are thriving in a warmer climate. But these are small birds and they have less of those physiological problems, I think, associated with just the fact that it is warmer. At the same time, warmer temperatures can be associated with higher survivorship of their nestlings, can be associated with higher abundance of insects, foods for them. So I think just warmer temperatures on the face of it are not necessarily a, a terrible threat to these birds from a sort of physiological standpoint. Another thing that I think is happening is that we have sort of a combination of these favorable characteristics in certain kinds of sites in the Adirondacks. So the map that you're looking at there shows what the, the area of the park that we sort of consider to be the boreal core. And those are the names, the ones that are, the spots that are named there are some of our biggest, you know, wetland comp, the, the ones that we think of as the charismatic megabogs, <laughs> um, the sites that Albertas go to, to find the species that I've been talking about. And they're all in that sort of corner of the park that we think of as, as the real true boreal. They are the biggest sites um, in part because they are big. They can warm up a lot. These big open sites can definitely be um, very warm during the day, more so than a place that has trees and, and keeps some of that sun from heating it up as much. Just by virtue of the geography of the park, they are also places that are naturally more dry. The, the prevailing patterns of precipitation in the Adirondacks are much higher in the higher elevation, more mountainous regions. So this is naturally a part of the park that is 
already warmer and already drier just because of geography. They are also in a region of the park that has relatively low human footprint. It's where most of our boreal is. It's where most of the big bugs are. There's a lot of boreal habitat and it, you know, it combines a lot of those good characteristics together in addition to being just sort of on average warmer spots. So I think that's part of what we're seeing as well. I do wanna say though that warm and dry conditions, although they might not be a threat and they could potentially even be a short-term benefit for these birds, are the very same sort of characteristics that can take a site like this and flip it to something that's totally different. And that's because in a large open peatland like Spring Pond Bog that you're looking at in this picture, what you see is a constant battle between the sphagnum and the trees. And the sphagnum usually wins because it doesn't mind the highly acidic conditions, it likes all the sunlight, and it doesn't mind having its feet wet. But as soon as we get warmer conditions and particularly drier conditions, those are the conditions in which the trees that are established in these sites get a foothold and grow. And eventually we have encroachment of trees and shrubs and an open peatland becomes instead a different kind of environment that over time is, is less suitable for these birds or perhaps more suitable for some of the competitors that we know also like these types of habitats. So I think warm and dry in the short term we found this interesting pattern, but in the long term, is definitely representative of a threat to the habitats that we know that they care about very much. So I'll end by just saying that at this point, we're sort of um, looking into lots of things, lots of ideas, have lots of interesting hypotheses about some of the mechanisms that might be underlying the patterns that we're seeing. We don't have any huge grants for the work at this point. We're doing what we can with students. Um, and there's many, many good examples of projects that students can, can hop onto and, and look at fun things for us. We take them into Shingle Shanty to what we call bog camp and we, we do a few days of work there and, and, and are looking at some neat stuff that way. And um, it's a great opportunity to get them involved in this long-term research and to plug in and try to find answers to little bits of questions that all build onto this larger story that we've been investigating for a number of years. Um, I'll just end with a thought that relates to the picture in the bottom right hand corner there. That's a sandhill crane and it's a crane, if you can see the picture, um, with two colts that it fledged in Oceda Marsh, which is a mile away from my house. Um, and that crane in fact comes over to the cow pasture that's across the road from my house. Um, the birds nested there successfully last year. It's a swamp in which I have also found olive-sided flycatcher, palm warbler, gray jay, uh, Lincoln sparrow, many of my same boreal species that I've been looking for for a long time. Similarly, the sandhill crane uh, bred successfully last year in Bloomingdale Bog, a picture that I showed you as an example of a perfect site. This is a new, relatively new bird for us in the Adirondacks. It's been slowly increasing and, and expanding in our region, um, and it's a bird that I'm terrifically excited about. <laughs> so while all of this makes me so sad to think about losing uh, that I've become very attached to, to think about the fact that I, I may not have my rusty blackbird and, and my Lincoln sparrow and, and some of those other species long term, we do know that these sites are highly, highly important for many, many species. Um, and if one of those is a six foot tall dinosaur of a bird, um, that's a terrific dancer, then, you know, I'll take it. Thank you.